Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A college sophomore tries to expose an alleged rape at a fraternity house. Did it lead to her murder? While on a secret mission, an American pilot is taken prisoner in Laos. The military says he's dead, but his family is convinced that he survived. After placing an ad for a roommate, a woman disappears. One week later, her mutilated body is found in a drainage canal. And the calculated deceptions of a romantic con man leave a string of victims across the country. These are stories you won't want to miss. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Vincennes, Indiana. Brooke Baker, a college sophomore, is stabbed to death in her own bed just a half a block from campus. There are signs of a struggle and massive amounts of blood. The bathtub is full and the water is running. Police start their investigation, certain that the case will be solved easily. Okay. okay. They're wrong. the right shoulder. Okay. 1535, clear. To me, the real key in solving this case is going to be when we answer the question, who was Brooke Baker and what was there about her life in the last few years of her life that led up to this extraordinary conclusion? As they began their investigation, police looked at several suspects. Was it angry fraternity brothers out for revenge or a killer posing as a potential roommate? Some thought it might be Brooke's landlord, who she said was spying on her. Or maybe there was someone else who wanted Brooke Baker dead. Brooke Baker had her sights set on a career as a top flight investigative journalist. I need the photographs. So at Vincent's University, she became very active on the school paper. I think one of the things Brooke really enjoyed was the power that came from being a reporter on the paper uh, gave her certainly recognition and vi visibility on campus, and I think she enjoyed the attention. Few 19-year-olds make deadly enemies, but Brooke may have been an exception. She had heard rumors about a date rape at a fraternity party, and she went after the story aggressively. Are you in a sorority? Right. So would you describe some of the incidences that had happened to you? It would have been very easy to work on the story and have nobody know about it but members of the staff, but the word was out everywhere, and I think the word was generated from Brooke. I think she wanted people to know what she was doing. Brooke's investigation was not welcome at the fraternity where the alleged rape had taken place. You better not write anything about us. <laughs> you better watch your back. She didn't worry about who she offended or whose toe she stepped on. If it was the truth, it was the truth. Fraternity members allegedly started sending Brooke emails, threatening her if she ran the rape story. She was unconcerned, but her mother was worried. I feared for Brooke's safety all the time, and I'd question her on it, and she'd, she'd say if it could save one girl from being raped or abused, she was willing to write the story and investigate the fraternity. Then one night, a truckload of fraternity brothers allegedly confronted Brooke at a friend's house. Was it conflict between Brooke Baker and the fraternity that led to her murder? Brooke moved into a new house where she thought she would be safe. The landlord was a campus police officer. Um, do you need any help with the boxes? Oh, no, I got it. Thank you. Sure. She told her parents that she had found them in her house at all hours of the day and night. 
What are you doing in my house? No, I'm sorry, you can't just come into my house. You have to, if you're gonna, if you need to come in here, you would have to call. You can't come into my house. Brooke also said that one time, the landlord shined a light through the windows. Another day, Brooke said he came in while she was in the shower. She felt uncomfortable enough that she told a number of people that she just uh, was just generally uncomfortable by the whole situation. Could an unwanted invasion by Brooke's landlord have led to an argument and murder? Vincent's police also had a third theory. A few days before her death, Brooke had advertised for a roommate in the campus newspaper. Someone who wants to come over to Brooke's house and knock on the door and say, hey, I'm here about your room. I want to be a roommate. What's Brooke's natural reaction going to be in that? Hi. Open the door and let them in. There was no evidence of forced entry, no sign of a struggle. Perhaps Brooke's ad led to her murder. The most promising clues were several samples of DNA. Police interviewed 400 people and tested 52 against those samples, but no match was found. Brooke's parents are left knowing only that their daughter's killer remains free. I'm obsessed with it. I can't live without justice for Brooke. I can't go on with my own life. That's all I can think. I want justice. Update. Two years after Brooke's murder, police got their first break in the case. However, it came at the cost of another life. When investigators searched the apartment of a missing Vincennes College student, Erica Norman, they found a crime scene disturbingly similar to Brooks. There was water running in the bathtub, and I knew right then that it was the same person who had committed the, the murder of Brooke Baker. Erica had last been seen leaving a restaurant with a man named Brian Jones. He was immediately brought in for questioning. When we interviewed Brian Jones, it turned out that uh, he was a roommate of an individual that was uh, seeing Brooke Baker at, within the last couple weeks of her death. A DNA match tied Jones to the murder of Brooke Baker. When Erica Norman's body was found two weeks later, Jones struck a plea bargain. He admitted to killing Erica, and in exchange, prosecutors agreed not to seek the death penalty in the Brooke Baker trial. Brian presented himself to me as someone that would have not stopped. That case stopped a serial killer, in my opinion. Brian Jones was convicted of both murders. He was sentenced to 60 years for killing Erica Norman. Jones was given an additional 20 years for the rape of Brooke Baker and a life sentence for killing her. Next, a woman battles for decades to prove that her husband isn't dead. He's the last American still a prisoner of the Vietnam War. On a chilly October morning, the family of Air Force pilot Charles E. Shelton was joined by friends and dignitaries at Arlington National Cemetery. They were gathered to mourn the death of a true American hero. But it was not Colonel Shelton who was laid to rest that day. It was his wife, Marion. Marion Shelton had spent the last 25 years of her life fighting what may be the final battle of the Vietnam War, the battle for the truth about her husband and more than 2,000 other American servicemen missing and unaccounted for since the war ended. Colonel Shelton was shot down over Laos in the spring of 1965. For more than 20 years, he was the only missing serviceman still officially listed as a prisoner of war. 
According to Charles Shelton's family, very little effort was made by the U.S. government to actually find Colonel Shelton and bring him home. They say strong evidence proves that he was still being kept prisoner years after the war came to an end. Charles Shelton and Marianne Volman were high school sweethearts. They were married in 1951, and their family quickly grew to include five children. Now look at the camera. My father and my mother's relationship, they were very much in love with each other. They were each other's first loves. Girl. Even after 10 years of marriage, it was just real intense. And, and she, he all, often said that he, that she was his first love and only love and last love. Charles Shelton joined the Air Force in 1954. Eight years later, he was sent to Saigon to train South Vietnamese pilots. Three years later, he began flying top secret missions over Laos. In 1965, Dad was definitely at the peak of his career. He was just about finished with his tour of duty in the secret part of the war in Indochina. He had been, at that time, the senior tactical reconnaissance United States Air Force pilot involved in uh, the war in Laos. Laos borders Vietnam on the west. Although Laos was officially neutral during the war, the North Vietnamese used Laotian territory as a military staging area. The United States secretly bombed targets there in numerous missions. In 1965, Charles was stationed in Okinawa, Japan with his wife and five children, but he was often gone for weeks at a time. I'll wait right here till you get back. You better. On April 20th, he said goodbye to Marion and returned to duty. She never saw him again. This is Grasshopper 32. Come in, Whiskey Angel. Nine days later, Charles' plane was shot down over northern Laos. American planes had made visual and radio contact, but a change in the weather delayed the rescue. There was a low cloud coverage, which made it impossible for anybody to get in really close and maneuver without a tremendous amount of danger. There was just no organized rescue in those days. That was 1965, he was shot down. If he was shot down in 1968, at the place he was shot down at, uh, I think he'd been out of there in uh, an hour and a half. After avoiding capture for three days, Charles Luck ran out. Instead of cooperating, Charles let his body go limp, forcing his captors to carry him. Charles Shelton's defiant resistance would become legendary. He was tough, and he was tenacious, and he just didn't let go. I think that if anyone could survive over there, it'd be Charlie Shelton. No doubt in my mind. The Air Force officially told Marion Shelton that her husband was a prisoner of war and returned his personal effects. Inside his footlocker, she found his dog tags and military ID which are normally carried by Air Force personnel at all times. Marianne also found her husband's camera. The roll of film inside included this picture, shot just before Charles' last flight. He was wearing what is known as a sanitized uniform, devoid of any official insignias. Many years would pass before the Shelton family understood its tragic implications. If you were captured in Laos, you were never going to come out. The war in Laos was that sensitive that uh, the government was not going to bother with uh, politicizing our presence there by looking for the return of POWs or hostages. And to this date, I don't believe our, our government has ever admitted to having troops present in Laos uh, officially, and we've never negotiated for the men in Laos officially. After Marion was told that her husband had become a prisoner of war, she and the children returned home to Kentucky. While the war dragged on for eight more years, secondhand news about Charles made its way back to Marion through the military grapevine. 
from time to time, pilots would come through from Indochina and they would come with some news by word of mouth about dad's situation. Tell mom that dad was sick or healthy, uh, if he'd been wounded or if he'd escaped again or this type of thing. Mama kept a lot of that information away from us because again, she was afraid that that would hurt us. And when Mama started telling me stories about what had happened to Dad, I heard about him being kept in a shallow grave with bars over it, and they poked him, trying to keep him awake. I couldn't stand to hear about stuff about torture. I have asked for this radio and television time tonight for the purpose of announcing that we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam. The war in Vietnam officially ended on January 23rd, 1973. Within 60 days from this Saturday, all Americans held prisoners of war throughout Indochina will be released. There will be the fullest possible All POWs would be included on one of two lists, those who were coming home and those who had died in captivity. Late that evening, the phone finally rang. Perhaps Charles Shelton would be on the list of POWs returning to their families. Hello? Yes, I am. Thank you. She began to cry, and of course I knew what that meant. Dad's name wasn't on the list. We naturally concluded that, therefore, we would be told soon just how he died in captivity and his body returned, and that was the end of the story. Instead, the story took a new turn. The list of soldiers who had died didn't contain Charles' name either. It seemed that the true status of Colonel Charles Shelton had yet to be revealed. When we return, Reports of a daring escape attempt. Could Colonel Charles Shelton still be alive? By April of 1973, 591 POWs had returned home to their families. But Colonel Charles Shelton was not among them. Four months later, the Pentagon issued a statement saying that there was no indication that any Americans were still held captive. But Marion Shelton continued to receive secondhand information that her husband and other Americans were still being held as prisoners. Mom realized, I think, more and more that if Dad would ever come home or if any of the prisoners would come home, that it really depended on the efforts of the families. And she seemed convinced of that early on you know, so much so that she ventured into Southeast Asia. Desperate for answers, Marion went to Laos just a few months after the war ended in search of proof that Charles was still alive. We met with villagers where he was supposed to have been or was held alive in a cave. There were sightings of him in the cave. And some of the villagers had actually visited some of these caves and had seen prisoners. My husband. She'd hoped that she would get some positive proof that her husband was still alive. She got no positive proof. Marion Shelton returned home empty-handed and disheartened. But two years later, events in Southeast Asia brought new information. Ten years to the day after Charles Shelton was shot down, Saigon fell to communist forces and thousands of refugees fled Vietnam. Hundreds and then thousands told of seeing American pilots, American prisoners still in chains, gaunt, starving, begging for food, in prison, in captivity, uh, on work gangs. Uh, th this is how we knew for sure that our men were left behind. For reasons that are still controversial, the U.S. government kept the refugees' accounts a secret. The stories are overwhelming in their specificity, in their clarity, and in their numbers. 
But if you mark it secret and you keep it locked up in the safes, behind locked doors, behind guarded doors, then we don't know it's there. Eventually, through the Freedom of Information Act, Marianne obtained hundreds of classified documents pertaining to her husband. Credible sources, many of them working for the CIA, reported that Charles was still alive as late as 1983, 18 years after he parachuted into Laos. There were so many documents that said uh, Colonel Shelton and other men were alive. It was apparent that there was just such a gigantic amount of evidence. There are reports in his file that he was shot in the legs because they were so tired of him escaping. And more reports that he just kept trying to escape afterwards. A particular report that was picked up off of the radio indicated that in 1968, the path at Lao turned down over to the North Vietnamese, and they decided to interrogate him. returned with more personnel to control Dad. He had already killed the other guards that were present during the interrogation. The report finished with the recommendation that this prisoner be moved north, whether that meant to China or Vietnam, we can't be sure, but it, it commented that he was incorrigible. The more that Marion dug through the official records, the more she believed that her husband was still alive. In October of 1980, she set out to convince a military panel. When I was in Vietnam and Laos in 1973, I met with a delegation of the North Vietnamese. When they set up and decided to hold these status review hearings, I don't think they had any idea about burden of proof. Burden of proof is a legal concept. What they were going to do was make the service member's family come in and prove he was still alive when the only information about whether he was really alive was in the hands of the government. That seemed quite unfair. We argued that instead it should be the service's duty to prove that he should be changed to killed in action. In other words, what evidence do they have that he was dead? They do have evidence he was alive. Now, what evidence do they have to change that? The board finds that by a preponderance of the evidence, Colonel Charles E. Shelton can reasonably be presumed dead. Despite Marion's pleas, the board maintained that Charles had been killed in action. But none other than Vernon Orr, Secretary of the Air Force, refused to accept the board's recommendation. In 1984, he upheld Charles Shelton's status as a prisoner of war, making him the only one of more than 2,000 missing servicemen not listed as presumed dead. You think your husband's alive? I think he very well can be, and probably is. During the 1980s, Marion became a firebrand for the POW MIA movement. They know there's prisoners over there, and I think they know that my husband's over there. Slowly, her heart started to break. The United States government, what my dad fought for, was not going to bring him home or was not trying hard enough. So it, it devastated her. Overwhelmed with grief, Marion Shelton committed suicide in October of 1990. Marion Shelton was the POW movement. She's done more, did more while she was alive than just about any other person uh, to try to bring those men home. Charles was my childhood sweetheart, my best friend, my protector. I prepared myself, as did my husband, for him to be wounded, captured, or killed. But we were never prepared for him to be abandoned by his own country. In 1994, at the request of his children, the Air Force officially changed Charles Shelton's status from prisoner of war to killed in action. A memorial service in his honor was held at Arlington National Cemetery on the same spot where Marion had been buried four years earlier. Next, 
a woman meets a mysterious stranger named Alice and then disappears. On an otherwise ordinary summer day, Florida resident Jane McGowan received a disturbing letter from her 34-year-old sister, Beverly. The handwritten note had been postmarked a day earlier. I've got to make some major changes in my life. I quit my job, sold the condo and furniture, and I'm leaving for a while. The next day, Beverly's brother, Steve, received a similar letter. Something bothered me because that's not the type of person that, that Bev was. She was not the kind of person, after spending all her money to try to get that condo and try to you know, land the job at the bank, which she was, seemed to be happy with, it was not her nature to just give, out, give up on everything and just walk away from it. That evening, Steve and Jane went to Beverly's condo. Her car was gone and her phone disconnected. Beverly had not been at work for two days. Yet some things seemed normal. There was her nightgown laying next to the bed. The bed wasn't made. I mean, it just looked like you know, she'd gone out for the day and had every intention of coming back that night. However, Steve and Jane did discover that their sister's address book, birth certificate, and passport were missing. The day Beverly McGowan left town, she sent a telegram to her mortgage company. She instructed them to foreclose on her condo and dispose of all of her belongings. Attention would soon shift to a new friend of Beverly's, a woman named Alice. Beverly worked at a bank and had purchased a modest condo in Pompano Beach. The week before her disappearance, she began advertising for a roommate. Bev came in one morning and said that she had advertised for a roommate and that this woman, Alice, was going to be moving in and approximately, I think it was the following Friday. And she just thought this woman was incredibly nice. It was gonna be great. They clicked. That's the way she felt. Now, as I was explaining to you, your life path number is your birth date. Beverly said that Alice was English. She drove a nice car and seemed to be a successful career woman. And they shared a common interest in the New Age movement, especially numerology. That shows that you are at a crossroads. She had asked Bev for some numbers that pertain to her life so that she could do a chart for her. And Bev gave her some numbers, not anything real personal. And she did an initial chart and then came back and said, I need more information. At which point, Bev volunteered her passport numbers, numbers on her birth certificate. Well, the first adjustment I see is a long trip. Alice told go, Beverly that she would find a lasting relationship and become wealthy. But she also warned that she would be deceived by a couple who was very close to her. I just need to be aware Two days after Beverly was last seen, a woman's mutilated body was found in a drainage canal a hundred miles from Pompano Beach. The victim's head had been crudely decapitated. Only a portion of the lower jaw and five teeth remained. Her hands had been severed, her throat slit, and a part of her abdomen cut away, apparently to remove a tattoo. We assume that whoever committed the murder was trying to conceal her identity. It was probably one of the most gruesome homicides that uh, our agency has investigated in recent years. The killer overlooked only one clue to the victim's identity, a small tattoo of a yellow rose on her right ankle. Beverly had just that tattoo. Four days later, dental records provided positive identification. The dead woman was Beverly Ann McGowan. We found nothing in her background that would indicate that uh, she was any type in any type of trouble or was involved in anything illegal. Authorities and Beverly's family were especially puzzled by her letters. They were all in her handwriting and there was no indication that she had been forced to send them. Investigators immediately searched Beverly's condo looking for something that might tie Beverly's decision to leave with her murder. 
They found a notepad with names and phone numbers of people who had called about the roommate ad. The last notation read, Alice, Tuesday, 6.30. No last name, no phone number. Alice was supposed to be on loan to the United States from England, working for IBM in, in South Florida. Upon checking with uh, the IBM Corporation, we learned that they had nobody on loan to South Florida from England, and that the office that Alice said she worked for in Fort Lauderdale, that they didn't even have an office in Fort Lauderdale. Well, if you pass the charge, it's going to be a charge. Investigators discover that on the day that Beverly's body was found, a woman fitting Alice's description used Beverly's Visa card at several shops in the area. Someone had also used the card to withdraw $300 from a local ATM. On Friday, the day after the body was discovered, the mysterious transactions continued. At a Miami travel agency, a person using Beverly's name and credit card reserved a rental car at London's Heathrow Airport. The travel agent described this person as a very masculine looking female that to them appeared to be a male wearing a cheap black Cleopatra wig. Taxis in London these days are so expensive. She also described her as having a British accent and a person that appeared to be very familiar with the Heathrow area in London, England. The customer claimed to be leaving for London on British Airways flight 292. It was scheduled to depart two days later on Sunday evening at 6.30. We checked the manifest for that particular flight and other airlines that were traveling to London on that particular day. Nowhere on any of the manifests did we see the name of Beverly Ann McGowan. On Monday, July 23rd, a person wearing a cheap-looking wig and posing as Beverly did pick up a car at Heathrow Airport. Back in the United States, Beverly's car was found at a motel near Miami International Airport. It had been there for at least five days. Investigators found only one significant clue. Hey, Dave, take a look at this. Four strands of black synthetic wig hair. It was clear to police that Beverly was the victim of a scam. But the killer or killers got away with only $1,000. The most puzzling part about it is the lack of motive. The savage nature in which the body was decapitated and the pains that they went through trying to conceal her identity isn't that of your normal uh, everyday uh, domestic killing. I try to think about the people that Bev worked for, uh, her friends, her relationships. What kind of person would, would be involved with it, with a murder like this? Why somebody would come into my sister's life and for a measly thousand dollars, just take it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Update. Several years after Beverly McGowan's murder, investigators identified the woman who called herself Alice as Elaine Antoinette Parent. She had been born in the Bronx, but had perfected a fake English accent. She also had a habit of stealing the identities of other women. They knew of at least 20 that she had used. Police dubbed her the chameleon killer. Acting on a tip, police showed up at the apartment Elaine Parent was renting in Panama City, Florida. She agreed to go to the police station for questioning, but while changing clothes in her bedroom, Parent shot and killed herself. Officials are convinced that Elaine Parent was responsible for Beverly McGowan's death, but to this day, they do not understand her motive. Next, a charming con artist known as the Sweetheart Swindler is finally behind bars. And a surprising update on our story of reincarnation. Can two lovers who died years ago be reunited in this lifetime?
On a previous broadcast, we profiled a con man who seduces lonely middle-aged women with promises of wealth and romance and then skips town with their money. Police call him the Sweetheart Swindler. A woman who asked that we call her Sarah met a man named Jerry Gable. He told her that he was a successful traveling jewelry salesman and that she was just the type of woman he wanted to share his life with. In less than two days, Jerry asked Sarah to marry him. It was really nice to think that I'd be able to relax, to travel, to have all these nice things, and I wouldn't have to work. To me, this was uh, very appealing. Only a few days later, Gable asked Sarah to deposit a check from out of state and to withdraw $3,000 in cash for him. That afternoon, Gable disappeared, and Sarah never saw him or her $3,000 again. I was angry. Truly, I was angry. It's a very devastating feeling. I'd like to see him pay for it. Update. The sweetheart swindler has been captured. Police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, arrested a man calling himself Robert Cook after he romanced another victim and then took her for $10,000. Police recovered a dozen false identification cards, all with different aliases from various states. They also found blank checks, apparently stolen from previous victims. The sweetheart swindler tried to prevent police from identifying him by filing off his fingerprints. However, authorities persisted, eventually learning that his real name was Alfred Barraquet, a Canadian national. In the end, Barraquet was convicted in three states for crimes related to his romance swindles. He served his time and has been released. The idea of reincarnation has intrigued people and cultures all over the world for centuries. Previously, we presented the case of a woman who was convinced that she is the reincarnation of a girl who lived more than a hundred years ago. And now there's a surprising update to this unusual story. Since she was a child, Georgia Rudolph has had reoccurring dreams and memories of the past of horses and carriages, a river, and old-fashioned stern wheelers. There is often a young man dressed in a brown suit and derby hat and the image of a dark-haired girl. My whole childhood, I thought I was crazy because I don't think there was a month that went by that I didn't have either memories or dreams. As a grown adult, Georgia tried therapy in the form of regressive hypnosis. When Georgia first contacted me, I felt it might be something like an early traumatic childhood memory that she was trying to remember, or possibly it could be an aspect of a multiple personality. Other than that, the reincarnation was probably the last thing in my mind about what had happened to her. While under hypnosis, Georgia said the girl's name was Sandra Jean Jenkins. The young man in the derby hat was her fiance, Tommy Hicks. According to Georgia's visions, in 1914, Tommy drowned in the Ohio River. His body was never found. Sandra Jean Jenkins was left unmarried and pregnant with Tommy's child. Distraught over the death of her fiance and unable to face the pregnancy alone, she took her own life. Georgia began searching for the people and places that she saw in her dreams. She traveled to Marietta, Ohio, where she met with journalist Ted Bauer. A lifelong resident of Marietta, Ted had worked for the local newspaper for more than 30 years. When Georgia arrived in Marietta, I said, I'll take you around and show you some of the places that you talked about over the phone. And she says, no, I'll show you where to go. I couldn't believe her knowledge of Marietta. I can't buy the reincarnation bit, but she has some kind of power, some way of knowing what happened in the past. In a nearby town, Georgia located a house that she says matches the house in her visions. Relatives of the former owner gave Georgia what she feels is evidence that Sandra Jean Jenkins 
did exist. They brought out a picture taken in 1908, and the girl that I call Sandra is standing in that picture. There was a statement made by a member of the family. I don't know this girl's name, but I know she drowned out back of the house. Update. After our broadcast, we were contacted by a college professor who had never met Georgia. He claimed that two years before he saw our story, he had visions that he lived in Ohio at the turn of the century. His name was Tommy Hicks. When I saw the original segment with Georgia Rudolph, I could just feel the anxiety building in myself because there was almost instant recognition. And my wife was watching me and thinking, what's wrong with him? And I was gripping the arm of the couch tighter and tighter and tighter as we went through. And then when Georgia finally said that his name was Tom Hicks, I almost fell off the couch. I think Jennifer. Two years before our story aired, Jack underwent regressive hypnosis in Jacksonville, Florida. The particular session that I went through, I was taken back to turn of the century Ohio, and I told the interviewer that my name was Tom Hicks. While under hypnosis, Jack said that a river seemed to play a large part in the life of Tommy Hicks, and that Tommy's younger brother had drowned. Jack also recalled that Tommy had a girlfriend with long, dark hair. I still remain somewhat skeptical. I need more proof. But we're getting closer and closer to the point where we cannot excuse it on the basis of chance or probability. Boat stuck. I was skeptical before the two regression sessions that I've had, but if they're not true, then there's an awful lot of very odd coincidences going on. Something very definite is going on but we have no rational explanation that science can provide as to what's happening. I suggest we keep an open mind. <laughs>